morning and welcome to this good morning and welcome to this session on public engagement with research at the EU Research and Innovation Days. We're very pleased to welcome you here this morning. Uh, I am together with uh, four fantastic speakers that we've uh, gathered together for you for this session uh, today. Um, uh, three of them are winners of the European Research Council's Public Engagement with Research Award. Uh, which we awarded for the first time this year in July. Uh, they are Eric van Sibylle from Utrecht University, Anna Davis from Trinity College Dublin, and Kostas Nikolopoulos from the University of Birmingham. Uh, and we're also joined by a special guest this morning, our fourth speaker, who is Kate Morris from the Irish Universities Association, uh, where she is the coordinator for Campus Engage um, at uh, the Irish Universities Association. Um, so the background to this event is indeed uh, the ERC Public Engagement with Research Award, which was designed to recognise uh, the fantastic work that some of the ERC's grantees do in terms of engaging and communicating with the public, and also to encourage uh, other grantees and researchers more generally to recognise the importance of uh, science communication and of engaging with the public and to offer some examples, some good practices and some inspiration. So I hope that the session this morning will be an opportunity to, to look at these three great examples and to hear from them uh, their tips and advice for those of you who may be interested in becoming more involved in public engagement work. Um, we will be using Slido during this session to collect input from uh, participants, uh, from our audience. And we'd like to start off with uh, a kind of icebreaker uh, exercise with three questions which are designed really to, to see who is with us this morning. Uh, we would have loved to be in a room together with all of you and to see you physically, um, but we're connecting remotely and we would like to, to see who uh, we have with us in the room today. So our first question um, is to find out uh, how many of you uh, were actually aware of uh, this public engagement with research awards that the ERC launched and the, the first uh, uh, winners were announced on the 7th of July. So um, I don't see it here on the screen, but I'm told that uh, the hashtag um, you should use to go to Slido is RI20 in capitals. And then when you have found that, you have to go to Hub 10, which is the ERC hub. So maybe we would like to give people a little while to find their way uh, to the right place in Slido. And then collect uh, your feedback on this first question about whether you... Um, ah, okay, great. We see that people are voting, so you must have found your way to the right place. Um, and we don't see the questions anymore, but uh, I... I believe that uh, B... In fact, I, I'm... I'm <laughs> I'm not sure what B was. Can anybody remember what B was? Ah, no, I wasn't aware of it. Okay, so um, this is news to most of our particip participants in the session this morning. 71% of you were not aware of the uh, Public Engagement with Research Board. So this will be a great opportunity for you to find out more about it and to hear from our three winners. Can we please have the second icebreaker question now? Hello. Okay. So, yeah, we would be interested to hear about your profile. Uh, I was expecting more options than this, but uh, let's go with the three that are here. So, um, if you could tell us whether you're A, a scientist, B, a researcher, or C, a policy officer or consultant. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't an option if you don't fall into any of those categories, but uh, let's uh, go ahead and allow people to vote. Okay, that seems to be stable. It looks like people have finished voting. So, uh, 6% scientists, 24% researchers, and 46% consultants. Um, 
And then the third question, uh, which appeared but then disappeared. Um, could we have it back on the screen, please? So, yeah, it would be interesting to hear to what extent our audience this morning is actually already engaged in public engagement with research. So the option A is uh, already active. B, which is not terribly legible, at least on my screen, is I would like to get involved but need some advice or support. And C, I'm interested but don't plan to become active myself. Okay, well, I think that gives us some interesting indications. So the most popular answer being A. Uh, so we have some quite experienced people in the session this morning who are already active in the area of public engagement. A second category, B, 37% who would like to get involved, but uh, could use some additional advice and support. And that's exactly what this session is designed to, to provide. And C, who uh, have an interest but don't plan to uh, actually get actively involved themselves. Okay, so that's it um, for our icebreaker. I'll now move on uh, to our first speaker, um, Kate Morris um, from Ireland. Thanks very much, Kate, for joining us bright and early this morning. Um, could you start off here. by... Great to have you. Um, so could I just start off by asking you to define in your own words how you understand public engagement with research uh, from your perspective with the, uh, the um, Irish uh, Universities Association? Thanks, Tony. So, uh, yes, I'm delighted to get this opportunity to, um, to speak to such a vast audience and to really let's start positioning this as kind of front and centre in the whole research and innovation agenda. So um, what we mean and what is our vision, because it's a, um, it's a vision, it's not you know, a fact, a lot of these things are movable, movable feasts, but what our vision for public engagement research is, it's a wide range of frontier research or other um, mission-based research approaches and methodologies that all consult, collaborate and communicate with the research users. So those research users or stakeholders are a, the public professional service users, policy makers in government, product users, civic, civil society organizations, industry, and other actors. And that is to collaborate in this in the in the in the journey, the research, learning, and development journey. So in Ireland, what we did is we set out um, our we tried to develop a collective vision to build um, a framework on how to do engagement with research. So what we did is we went out to all of our, our friends and colleagues in the UK, in the, in the Europe, our, our friends in the EU Commission, um, civic society organizations, researchers, students, um, to build a framework. And we, we consulted with them and we reviewed the literature. And what we built was this, it's, um, it's like a, a various, it's a number of approaches on the research journey where you can bring in these key stakeholders. So that's anything from generating your research idea together um, with those stakeholders to designing research, planning together for what the impact, the potential impact could be, should be. Um, we can bring these stakeholders in in terms of data collection, which lots of our speakers, or a couple of our speakers today have done, um, all AKA citizen science. Um, we can bring these stakeholders in in terms of data access, sharing data, to build a more universal data evidence base or practice policy decision making. Um, we can also on this on this journey, we can exchange knowledge, uh, we can carry out outreach activities. And also at the end of this journey to bring in those stakeholders to review how we have done on this, on this during the research project. Um, and also to, to assess the longer term impacts from, you know, at a later date. Uh, we've produced this guide. So at this session, I really want to um, give tips, tools to uh, listeners. So in, we have developed this guide, which is on, our, on the Campus Engage website, and it's called A Framework for Engaged Research, which I've just been quoting. And this has been built by our fabulous colleagues and across all of the Irish universities. So we have eight universities in Ireland, and they've all contributed to the, the co-authorization co of this with other stakeholders. 
Um, and we've also delivered a training program on this, of course, with our, our most fabulous PIs and experts um, in Science Foundation Ireland, Irish Research Council recipients, higher uh, health research board uh, recipients of funding. So that is what our interpretation and our vision of public engagement re with research is. Does that answer the question, Tony? That's fantastic, uh, Kate. Uh, thanks very much. And maybe I'll see or, or, or someone else can see if we can pop the link to that uh, um, a guide that you mentioned, the framework for engaged research into the, the chat uh, so the participants can access it directly. But I imagine if they Google it, they can they can also find it that way. Um, just a second question, Kate. Uh, so, I mean, you, you've explained the framework, but why do you think it's uh, it's so important for researchers and scientists to engage with the public? Um, so this is this is a really fascinating and interesting question, and it's 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 fundamental to our dialogue today. And I think that if you pick up any newspaper of the last twenty four months plus, we we'll see that the European project itself, the free movement of people, goods, services, capital, a fundamental rights based approach, um, it's it's being ideologically challenged. Yeah, and this this kind of two viruses that we're fighting. Um, and it's this virus that um, Eric's work relates to, which is about an infodemic of you know, false news, pseudoscience, circulation on print, social media, um, and also the challenge of expert opinion, this kind of opinion from above, it's being challenged. And what I believe why this engaged research approach is so fundamentally important is that we, we need to change our course and we, we need to start bringing these research users into the research process in order to explain and highlight how important the EU project is, but also how it makes all of our lives better, all underscoring all. Um, and the risk here, of course, is if, if, if we don't change our course and if we don't take action, that there will be a further dismantling of, of, of Europe, further polarization of opinion, further distrust in science, in expert opinion, and really what we need to do is now provide solutions. OK, so the solutions here that the European Commission, through their research and innovation processes and funding in this billion euro venture capital you know, investment, is really that we, can, we need now to build a culture of evidence-informed policymaking, a, a culture in government, but also a culture on the street, within our homes, um, to, to build, to rebuild the trust in science um, and in expert opinion and to bring these research users, users on our journey, bring them to the table um, and, and to, to, you know, actually, when you think about it, our lives are actually dependent, lives are dependent on this as we, as we scramble to find a vaccine and, um, you know, we're dependent on the public to carry out these um, clinical trials. You know, so this, this trust is really, really something very important at the moment. Um, and there is a big there's a position for EU leadership in this in this in this uh, in this role um, in terms of weighting and criteria for research applications, and we need to put this more centrally in this process. And um, just as a case study, Ireland has done really well. We would we, we believe in this. You know, we've, we've seen the coming together of researchers, policymakers, uh, production line managers of PPE gear, the public, the media to build this togetherness. And I believe the EU has an opportunity now to really leverage this, to look to this togetherness, to build um, a vision for the EU going forward. We heard the state of this fantastic, hugely ambitious State of the Nation address last week um, with enormous ambitions for emissions, for example, using it as a case study, you know, from 40 to 55 percent reduction in emissions to make Europe the first carbon neutral continent like we, this is, it's not going to be achievable unless we cooperate, unless we involve, like the only way to get there is through research and innovation, but it needs to be within cooperation with those who are, you know, as part of the cause, you know, so we bring the farmers, we bring mm -hmm. the aviation industry, we bring the civic civil society NGOs around the table to start planning. And through this involvement, you will, it will lead to better early adaptation of new practice policy um, yep. products, but also it will it will also lead to better um, implementation. And what it is, is it's by treating the cause and not the effect. Mm. You know, we need to okay, stop plugging, so. yeah, yeah, let's stop plugging the, the problem with fines on emissions and start 
treating the cause. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for, for being with us uh, this morning and thanks for setting the scene with those uh, introductory thoughts. So let's move on now because we, we really want to hear from the three winners of uh, our award um, to hear what they did and what convinced our jury that they, uh, they, they should win uh, this prestigious uh, European Research Council Public Engagement with Research Award. Uh, so let me start off by inviting uh, the, the first of our three grantees, Eric van Sibylla from Utrecht University, to uh, share with us a little bit his story and what he's been doing in terms of public engagement uh, and what led to him winning in the, the first category of the award this year. Over to you, Eric. Thank you, Tony. In my ERC project, I want to find out whose plastic waste ends up where to play the get blame game, so to say. I'm fortunate that this is a topic that receives significant public attention. When I'm at a family event, I never have to explain the relevance of my science. But with a topic with so much policy impact, also comes great responsibility to get the science straight. And that's why I want to debunk the myths out there about the plastic polluting our ocean. Many people think that there are islands of trash floating around in our ocean. They may have heard of this area twice the size of France, full of plastic waste. I've even heard MEPs talk about this infamous island. But it's not true. There are no islands of plastic anywhere in our open ocean. In some regions, yes, tiny pieces of plastic do accumulate. But if anything, it's like a very thin bouillon. Sure. Every now and then you stumble upon a net like this one shown here. It's an abandoned fishing net and an absolute atrocity that these float around in our ocean. But these, of course, are not the reason we want to ban single-use plastic. There are no straws or plastic bags in this photo. In my Topios ERC project, we found that only 1% of all the plastic that has ever gone into the ocean is still floating at the surface of the ocean. 99% of the plastic is missing. We have dark plastic, if you want. Most of the plastic must be either on coastlines or in the deep sea, or most worryingly, in the stomachs of animals. Where the plastic actually is, has huge implications, of course, for how we can ever clean it up and fix the problem. So I created a web portal, busting seven different myths about the plastic soup that I often came across in my discussions with others. From the island of trash to the perceived lack of personal actions to fix it. I launched the web portal on World Ocean Days and combined it with an extensive press campaign. I was interviewed in dozens of countries with a reach of millions. And I'll keep on going because I enjoy it and get energy out of sharing my science and doing public engagement. But also because I really think that solving the plastic problem starts with fully understanding the scale of the plastic problem. How can we clean the ocean if you don't even know where 99% of all the plastic is? Thank you. That was really interesting. Okay, so I think we've lost the moderator. Um, well, does anybody have a question? Yeah, I have a question, actually. No, it's fascinating. And I just wondered, in terms of uh, the impact that your web portal had, did you, did you monitor any analytics around you know, the countries through which access the, the website or anything like that? Yes, of course we did that. And um, it's really interesting to see that there's much broader reach than just in the Netherlands. Um, it's hosted by our university, but we get yeah people from all across Europe and even the world um, to access our website. Yeah, so it is. It so the good thing is that we have this website now. The tricky part, I think, is that we need to maintain the website. 
And I think that is always a challenge in, in setting up these kind of tools uh, or almost any public engagement is that it's easy to think of it. It's easy to start it, but then to keep the, the energy and also the funding to maintain it, to keep it up to date, to keep it um, with the latest science, that is really the challenge. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Sure I think the resources. I think I'm going to just go ahead with my presentation now um, while we're waiting for, for Tony to come back online. So just to introduce myself uh, again, I'm Anna Davis uh, from Trinity College Dublin. Uh, delighted to be here today and to share with you some of my insights around public engagement. Um, I'm just going to cover three points in three minutes. First, the goals of my project Sharecity. Second, why online and social media engagement was key to achieving those goals. And third, some lessons about engagement that I learnt from my experiences along the way. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my slides, but, but if so, we can move to the next slide. Um, so why was Sharecity created? I developed it because our food systems, and particularly our urban food systems, are unsustainable. Uh, despite major improvements in the scale of food production, a third of all food still goes to waste and around a billion people still go hungry. Add to that the fact that the food system contributes about a quarter of all global greenhouse gas emissions, and it's clear that we need to find alternative, more sustainable ways of doing things. Food sharing historically, the bedrock of human civilization, has been suggested as one option. But we know little about contemporary sharing and its impacts. And that's where Sharecity comes in. We've been identifying and assessing a whole range of urban food sharing initiatives internationally to see what contribution they make to sustainability. And a part of the process, we developed the first ever crowdsourced international food sharing database, the Sharecity 100. And next slide, please. We developed the database to map sharing initiatives across 100 urban areas as we were focused on food sharing that uses smart technologies such as websites, apps and social media platforms, we were able to identify many initiatives using keywords entered into internet search engines. However, we were aware we could be missing a lot. We needed help to ensure we were capturing as much of the sharing activities as we could. And this is where our online and social media strategy came in. We started by contacting global sharing networks. We also worked with online media outlets. We used Twitter and Facebook to advertise what we were doing and provided people with simple and easy mechanisms to share their knowledge with us. Ultimately, we collected and analyzed more than 4,000 initiatives. We were keen to give something back to all those who had helped us. And we did this by converting our database into a user-friendly online resource. So do check it out on our website, which is sharecity.ie. It's been accessed 150,000 times from over 100 countries, so we think we've achieved our goals here. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition, we were able to build strong relationships with food sharing initiatives, which ultimately led to our co-design sustainability assessment toolkit, Share It. And this was the first lesson that I learned about public engagement. Investment early on can lead to long-term rewards far beyond your initial expectations. The second lesson, I think, is to make it easy for people to participate. While obvious, it took us a bit of time to get our communications right. Uh, and one final lesson I learned is to make time for engagement. Estimate the time you expect it to take and double it. Final slide. So just to conclude, for researchers to give public engagement the attention it deserves, our host institutions, project evaluators and funders must also recognise its resource intensity so that they can support researchers to undertake it appropriately. Thank you for your attention. Any questions from anyone? I, I just have a quick comment, which, uh, if that's okay, um, I, what I find so encouraging and so amazing about this kind of citizen science, would you explain this as like a citizen science project where individuals map um, are mapping their work through the input of their data on your system. So they have like open access to your system to input their activity, which is it's, the snowballing effect of this for me is, is immense. And it's it's like such bang for your buck in, in terms of it with a classic EU research project. You pick your, 
you align yourself with your project partners. But in this case, we've got a global network, a global community of practice, sharing their insights on what works, what doesn't work. Um, and it, it's just, it, it, is that the methodology that, that anybody can go in and update their, their, their data ad hoc or... No, not really, Kate. It's okay. more that uh, we were we were we were sort of web scraping the the internet for information, but because of the diversity of food sharing internationally and the vocabulary and the the articulation of it is very different, we were missing a lot potentially. So we called out to uh, various networks through the internet, through social media, through online media, and I think that that was actually uh, one of the the most rewarding aspects was was working with organisations like RTE's Brainstorm, which is a, a me online media a channel which enables research to communicate to public um, in a very easy way, and and we learned a lot about how to communicate. Um, in a very, you know, taking our high risk science, if you like, to to a general audience, and, and I think that's really important, not just for for public engagement, but also for policy impact. And have you noticed that uh, any of our any of our speakers today notice that you get more traction in terms of citations from your public engagement work? Those classical impact metrics are are you see an um, you know an upturn in 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 the citation because of this activity. Uh, I'm not sure, but from, from my perspective, it's quite early to get uh, that, that kind of impact. But what I did notice with, with the special issue that we had worked and disseminated through, through Brainstorm, I think it was, or possibly the conversation, um, the downloads of that paper were twice as many as any other in the special issue uh, after a, a few weeks. I think, you know, the impact on science uh, it, it is a bit further down the track. Mm -hmm. Are you on mute, Tony? Okay. We can see you, but we can't hear you. Oh, great. Did you um, why don't you just why don't you just carry on without me then? Oh no. No, 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 no. <laughs> can you hear me? Yep. Perfectly. Yep, no. Ah, okay. Um, so apologies uh, uh, for being kicked out and uh, struggling a little bit to, to rejoin, but it sounds like you've been having a good conversation uh, while I've been away, so I'm very sorry to have missed that. Um, I, I, if I understand correctly, Eric and Anna, you've both uh, uh, sort of presented a little bit about your activities, so maybe looking at the time also we should move on to Costas and then we can open up to to a more general discussion, which I think uh, you've already uh, started a little bit with Kate, but we can perhaps bring in some questions from, from our participants as well. So is that okay if we move on to, to you now, Costas? Yes, thank you. So it's good to have you back, Tony. Um, so where does mass come from? Uh, this is really the fundamental question I'm trying to answer with my research. You, we discuss about mass in our everyday life, but when we look at it from the smallest to the largest scales, its origin is really a mystery. In 2012, we discovered the Higgs boson, and we have been studying its properties ever since. We now know that the mass of the heavier matter particles is originating from its interaction with the Higgs field. However, what about the lighter matter particles, the electrons, the muons, and the quarks that make up the proton and the neutron? Is it still the Higgs field responsible for this mass? And if yes, why the masses of the elementary matter particles differ by so much? spanning five orders of magnitude or more. Looking at the cosmos, we now know that 85% of the mass in the universe comes in this, as of yet unknown form that we call dark matter. Dark matter holds together our galaxies, but what is it really made of? To study the Higgs boson, we go to the CERN Large Hadron Collider. We produce millions of Higgs bosons and we study in detail the debris of the decays. To search for dark matter, we go to deep underground laboratories and we look and try to discern the faintest signal of potential interactions of dark matter with our detectors. I have been fascinated since a child with this research and have been so much interested. I have been always trying to bring this to the, to the public, but I always find it challenging to overcome the stereotypes about scientists and science and in particular physics. However, art is universally able to engage humanity and the realization that we could use art to side, as a tool to sidestep stereotypes and preconceptions was a really game changer for me. In this journey, I was very privileged to, 
to meet uh, artist Ian Andrews, who was really inspired by the visual language we use in particle physics, and dancer and choreographer Mary Pardalaki, who was intrigued by the transformation of the particles. Both of them learned about my research, um, incorporating their um, artistic practice, personal practice, and in fact, they became ambassador of science themselves. So the underpinning idea of what we did was to inform, educate, and inspire the public about particle physics through art. We engage with artists first. Artists, like scientists, discuss about their work, ongoing and completed. Ian's and Mary's um, work um, was expressing concepts of particle physics, where we had an opportunity to discuss with artists about those. Then we communicate to the public the outcome of the artistic process through exhibitions and performances. The often received comment that we have never seen anything like this before is a testament to the creativity of the artist on one hand, but also the success of this approach. Finally, we try to replicate the process that we follow with Ian and Mary at schools by creating workshops where students will learn about particle physics and then express these concepts through art. For me, it has been a tremendous journey. I have learned many things about the creative process in art, about education, even through the examples I had to use for my science and even for myself. Um, but the bottom line in the end, what I really realized is that art and science may have more in common than one may think initially. In fact, what we call the artistic process, the creative process in art, is what we call research in science. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Costas. Um, I understand that we do have some questions that have come in for our speakers uh, via Slido. So um, let's, in a couple of minutes, put, um, oh, okay, straight away, let's put those up then. Um, <clears throat> so this is a question for all of our speakers. How much of your public engagement campaign was planned at the proposal stage, or did you discover the need for it during the course of the project? Interesting question. Thanks very much to Tommaso Perani. Um, wh which of our speakers would like to have a go at uh, tackling that one? I can. Anna, yes. Yeah, I, can come in. I can come in on that, Tony. Uh, certainly that the phases of the research were in the research proposal. So the idea of building a database was, was included, but the public engagement element of it really wasn't considered at that stage. So it was uh, at, in, the, in the process of building the database, it became clear that we would potentially be missing a lot if we didn't reach out to people uh, more broadly who were actually doing the food sharing or who were engaged with food sharing. So in order to make a robust data set, this was the first time that these kinds of activities were being mapped. So to make it as robust as possible, we needed, we recognised, to go out to broader public audiences. And that's really uh, when the idea came about the, the kind of crowdsourcing element. Mm. Thanks very much, Anna. And Eric, how about you? Is that something that you planned from the outset of your research, or did the idea come to you along the way? Well, I've, I've always been interested in, um, in talking about my research in, uh, to school classes, to groups, to uh, policymakers, to the media. Um, so, of course, I've always been discussing these myths and what is true and what is, what, what is science-based. Um, actually, creating this portal really came out of the, the need that there were so many of these, of these myths around, and I decided to just bundle them all onto one uh, place. So the portal really came after um, we were doing the research rather than at the proposal stage already. But I think that if you want to do it even better, then, of course, plan it at the proposal stage already. That is where it should be, because the public engagement in the end is an integral part or, or can be mm. an integral part of the science that we're doing. So I don't see a reason why not to plan it at the start. Mm. Great. Do we have another question from our participants? Or yes, OK. Uh, what's your criteria for public engagement? How do you measure impact? Um, Kate talked about impact in her introduction. And what is the level you define as successful? Kate, do you want to come in on, the, on this one? Uh, are there any sort of particular KPIs um, or, or metrics that you could recommend to people that they can, can use that are relevant? Uh, again, we've put a huge amount of energy and um, we've consulted widely on this with the stakeholders to build a framework for impact. 
and what we fundamentally we, we, we position is that you must think about this from the very beginning of your, your frontier research project. So when you're generating your research idea, you're working on that with those who, are, who will potentially be impacted by your work. Um, and we have built this framework and what we're really pushing here is that we're, we're, we're really looking much further than beyond just the basic, the, the classic industry engagement metrics around I, you know, IP, tech transfer, citations or generated income. And it's to look at the more societal, um, the greater agenda, the societal impacts, environment, health, well-being, um, building capacity, social capital. Um, and we have, again, on our website, campusengage.ie, we have a publication that lists a whole series of metrics or indicators of success under each of these eight broader head headings. So I really encourage your, your listeners and participants today to access on that website. And just also to note that there is another fantastic EU Commission website called Engage 2020, and it is an actions catalogue which lists a whole series of different ways for researchers to think about from the very beginning of which, which methodology or which engagement action is appropriate for their research topic, whether it's science theatre or whether it's around um, citizens' assemblies or um, information research cafes. There's a whole list there. So I would guide, I would, I would, I would encourage your, your listeners to seek out these tools to, to, to support the planning for impact piece and to broaden out those impact categories. Thanks very much, Kate. Do, do we have a third question from the audience, perhaps, and then we can open it up also to a bit of a, an exchange between our, our, our four speakers? I think this is the one that we had before. Yes, okay, here's another one, not all quite visible. Uh, so much public engagement funding is project specific. How can we sustain this great engagement beyond the horizon of these uh, projects? So, I, and I couldn't see, quite see the last part of the question there, unfortunately. But um, yeah, that, that, this is a question uh, um, about longer term impact. Uh, I mean, from our three award winners, once your ERC project is finished, uh, do you think you'll continue engaging with the public in the same way? Or is this something that basically is just for the lifetime of the project and uh, then afterwards you'll move on to something else? If Maybe I can start to answer, like to I, um, oh, so, Eric, yes, sure. <clears throat> yeah, so very quickly. So, um, of course, I will continue to engage with the public because that's what I enjoy and I get energy out of it. Um, but I do have to challenge that the portal that we created needs to be kept updated, needs to be always reflecting the latest science. And that is very difficult to do beyond a project. So um, I think that the ERC or other policymakers should really think about l more lasting legacies and how they can support that. Um, if, if we want this public engagement to be out there, then, uh, then we also need to support it beyond the lifetime of the projects, I would say. Thanks, Eric. I think, Kostas, you were going to come in as well? Yeah, sure. Um, the, I think the legacy is a, is a crucial aspect. Um, in fact, in my case, the the activities, it's, it's a matter also of, of, of quality and, and quantity of the impact. So in our case, the the art activities are relatively low quantity, low volume. We have we can reach so many students at one time, um, but then I think it's high impact. On the other hand, the, the involvement of the artists creates, I mean, and the materials and so on creates a, a cost which is directly proportional to the number of of students you can you can read so definitely the taking this forward it, it's 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 a challenge and and i think that it is um, up to funders to support these activities if they think that they are um successful based on the evidence but also we try to to investigate further further uh, resources for example we have teamed up with the institute of physics here in the uk in ireland and in particular the, with the the West Midlands branch uh, in the local area, which supports our activities. So I think, on one hand, grants are maybe good to to develop and uh, you know start some new activities. And I think we have to find mechanism, maybe through local 
um, support um, to carry them on once they are matured and developed. I think everybody likes to find new ideas, but I think we, we need really to keep the, the ideas of the, the thing that work running in the future. Mm. Thanks very much. Anna, did you want to come in on this? Oh, Sorry. yes, no, please do, Kate, yes. And then, and then let's give uh, Anna a chance to come yeah. in as well. Uh, sorry, Anna, but I was just going to say that I think it's really important that we think about the sustainability of these initiatives from the planning, you know, that we're working collectively to think long term from the very get go about how we sustain any of the outputs from the projects and that it's a kind of a self-sustained plan for um, journey mm. to, to, to sustain it long term. Thanks, Kate. Uh, Anna, uh, briefly, and then I, I want to make sure we also have a, a, an additional bonus video that I must try to squeeze in before the session ends at 9.45. So, uh, but on, on this question uh, yeah, of just, sustainability and yeah, legacy. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of echoing the other uh, speakers' points, but I do think that, say, something like the, the ERC framework has these kind of proof of concept grants, and, and traditionally these have been given to kind of commercialization um, products from research, which is fantastic. But I think, you know, the recognition of other forms of innovation and innovation, which could be social innovation, which I'm thinking, say, Costas's project, you know, this, this science communication dimension is really, really important for society, as Kate mentioned right at the beginning. So I think, you know, opening up support systems like the proof of concept to matters of social innovation more, to uh, public engagement activities, particularly those which have demonstrated impact, which we've just talked about. So I think that there are ways and means to support, you know, maybe feasibility studies to make these things say self-sustainable or as a social enterprise or something. I think we need to be a bit more creative about how we think about supporting science. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, as I said, I would really like to squeeze in. Uh, we have a, a bonus in this session, which is a message from one of our ERC grantees, one of our PIs, Heino Falke, uh, who was involved in this amazing uh, image of a black hole that was released um, uh, last year and which generated really a lot of public interest and media coverage. And Heino has some tips also on science communication and public engagement in the form of a video message, which I think we can share with you now. On April 10, 2019, we presented the first ever image of a black hole. And that image sparked the imagination of people around the globe. Four and a half billion people saw that image. Of course, we were lucky because we had an image to share that showed something that is deeply scientific and brought us to the edge of space and time. An event horizon, a black hole, is actually mathematically almost incomprehensible to most of us, but an image is easy to understand and is something that everybody can relate to. And I think that's something that is true for all kinds of signs. We need images that actually radiate and tell the story of what we do. In fact, during the entire process, from the conception of the idea to the final experiment to the publication, we always thought about what is the image that we're going to show? And what is the story that we are telling? And that's not only good for public outreach, that's also good for yourself as a scientist. Ask yourself, what is the final result? What is the image that I'm going to show? What is the image that I radiate? What is the story that I have to tell in my science? It's images that spark imagination. Great. Thanks so much, Heino, for sharing that uh, important message on visual uh, storytelling. We, we literally only have a couple of minutes left, so I would just like to invite our four speakers just to share one key takeaway from this session in literally a couple of words. Uh, that's all we have time for, unfortunately. So let's go in reverse order. If I could ask Kostas first, if you could just share one last thought, uh, a short, uh, short phrase. I think that's Public engagement is rewarding and is worth doing. It's just that it's quite some effort and people should keep that in mind when they get involved. Thanks, Costas. Anna, what would you say? I think it's making time for engagement and enjoying the ride. It's, it's, it's a new skill set for us often, um, but we always like learning new things as scientists. Great. Eric? 
Yeah, so for me, public engagement is about actually interacting with the people that we do the science for. And in that sense, it's indeed very engaging and only gives me energy. And Kate, what would you like to leave us with as a last thought? I would have a call to action for greater investment in the consultation, the collaboration and the communication process in waiting and setting criteria for for uh, research and innovation frontier science. Great. So thanks very much to our four speakers for joining us this morning. Thanks to everybody who tuned in. And just for information, the European Research Council is planning to make another award for public engagement uh, with research in 2022. So keep your eyes open for the announcement uh, sometime next year. And we really encourage you to continue uh, engaging with the public and uh, sharing fantastic stories about your research. So thanks again and uh, see you soon. Hey.